So I'm curious. I just started sort of the beginning of, of your uh, of your um, uh, presentation. You talked about a, a you know, 20 person staff uh, with a but with a 12 million dollar annual spend, you know, roughly more or less. And that, so that's a, a pretty high um, a ratio of uh, or, you know, of an, essentially people to, um, uh, to to dollars out the door. You um, obviously have invested more in partnerships and in uh, projects and contracts than you have um, in the size of the staff and growing the staff to, to be too, you know, to be to be large. Can you give us a little sense of that? I think that Michael really had established that as a precedent initially, as, as really being heavily partnership oriented. Um, but I hadn't really seen those figures before, and it's uh, striking to have only 20 people uh, working uh, to have $12 million worth of impact. So can you speak a little bit about that philosophically? And, and how yes, that you're right. Uh, if Michael did implement the sort of um, partnership, not only partnership philosophy, but uh, partnerships in practice, uh, and that model is still sacrosanct in the organisation. We know that we don't have all of the answers and can't deliver all of the impact that we would like to uh, achieve, but so we invest in the best and brightest minds and partnerships across Australia wherever they may be found. I think um, one observation I would make is that we've had most success in those partnerships and building the capacity of other organisations where some level of capacity in the organisation already existed. So we invested heavily in the capacity of Bush Heritage Australia, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, Greening Australia and other partners, not only to do conservation but in their organisational development, their fundraising and other things so that they can be more uh, sustainable over the long term. We've seen uh, less, I think, long term success from organisations that were started from scratch uh, to do uh, conservation work. And I think that's just a function of needing to have a minimum scale that you can build on in order to be successful in the long term. So a number of organisations that have, that have uh, you know, been set up in the last couple of years and have asked uh, TNC to support them and because they haven't had that you know, really core capability and minimum scale that you need to be uh, sustainable, they haven't succeeded as those well as those ones that have. Um, so yes, the partnership model is absolutely core, uh, but um, choose our partners wisely. Right. Yeah, another early on slide you put up, um, which I think is, is somewhat related to this, is the project life cycle slide, um, which I think is a great way of, of thinking about, you know, our work. Oftentimes, or, or in the past, we've thought about the way we work by as uh, going into a community and then essentially investing and staying in that place for a long time and dealing with whatever issues came along. That's, I think that's increasingly less how we work and how we think about the world, and we think more about you know, what are the big problems facing, you know, large numbers of people and how can we tackle that problem and figure out how to get it to scale. So the, that, that project life cycle diagram, I think, is a pretty useful way of, 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 uh, of thinking about how to, to, to tackle these issues. Can you sort of explain how you came to, to that realization? You're, you're three and a half years in. I, maybe you've been thinking about that all along, but I think that's a really nice graphic dis depiction of, of uh, how to think about um, projects? Uh, yeah, no, we have been thinking about that uh, for some time and this is just a, a way of sort of um, articulating that it came about, um, we'd already been thinking about but was reinforced through the Google partnership we have as part of Fishbase and, and thinking and, and they thinking about what is the end outcome, what is the end, what is the product outcome that in that case technology outcome that they're trying to achieve or um, uh, outcome for people that they're trying to achieve and how do you design uh, for that. We, and we're using end games. We started off by talking about exit strategies, um, but that uh, the feedback that we got on that wasn't great because if you talk to an Aboriginal community, for example, about an exit strategy, then it creates the, it creates the sense that you're going to do a piece of work for a while and then you're going to leave. Um, but they have, you know, expectations of very long-term partnerships. So we can, we can talk about the role of TNC changing over time and the end game that we're working towards without creating the impression that we're not going to be there with them for the long haul. So, but if you look at uh, the project life cycle, the way many organisations and we have 
across the conservancy, I'm sure historically done it, is you think about a, a project and you hire a person and they're going to run that project from start to end. But the skills that you need to, to uh, scope a project, to explore its commerciality, to do the good science, all of those things are very different to the ones that you need to have in place just to sustain a project over the long time, over the long term. So we're not just thinking about the project life cycle uh, you know, sort of on a per project sense, we're thinking about it across the whole organisation. So, you know, who is the right person to manage a project at that, at that size? And then how do they transition that project to management by a different person who has those skills as that project evolves over time? And what that does is allows the staff who are working on their projects to always be working to their strengths, but with the opportunity to work on different things. So, for example, uh, James Fitzsimons, our Director of Conservation, is going to be doing much more work on the early stage development of projects. He's very good at science and policy, and so he'll do the early stage development of those projects, make sure that they're scientifically rigorous, all of those things, and then they'll hand off to more of a commercially focused team uh, for program delivery and scale, and then the next project comes into James's pipeline. So he's always working on something different, getting the opportunity to work on different things, but always having the opportunity to leverage his strengths. Gotcha. gotcha. Uh, that's a um, very useful way to think, think about it, and I, I think um, that, that graphic uh, is, uh, is, is a nice reminder that the projects do have a life cycle, and there is a way to think about them um, that isn't just about, although very important, it's not just about that result on the, in that specific you know, kilometer, square kilometer, or a chunk of, of ocean. Um, the uh, I had a question around um, your board. Uh, you know, the Australia program has long had a, a, a board. I think Rob McLean was one of the first, or might have been one of the first board members, and, and still is now. I think continues to be chair of the board. Um, the um, one of the things I noticed that you have done recently is focused on a greater diversity uh, on the board um, to to try to attract and recruit. Uh, more diverse Australians to the Conservancy's mission to support uh, the mission. And um, can you tell me first, sort of, you know, why do you think that w has risen in importance for you personally? And then um, uh, tell me a little bit about tell her, tell us a little bit about the the um, uh, the progress you've made on that front. Uh, thanks, Charles. Yeah, we had a. Um, I think the focus on diversity was not only a proactive one because the organisation cares a lot about it, but it was also a reactive one. Uh, about 18 months ago, we had a, you know, we have a smallish board in Australia. It's not like, you know, boards in the US that have 25 or 30 people on them. Our board currently has 12 uh, people on it, and that's about the right size. Uh, but, you know, sort of two years ago, it was there was only one woman on the board. Um, and so we went to uh, a recruitment agency that helps, you know, find the best and brightest of boards. And we said um, we need to address, in the in the very first instance, the gender diversity issue that we have on the board. And so we need to find four new directors, all of whom are women, uh, and preferably uh, that some are younger, so we can get some more age diversity in there. So we've gone about that. We now have uh, 12 board members, it's a seven-five uh, split in gender. Um, and hopefully if we can transition one board member off and bring another one in um, sometime in the next year or so, we'll be 6-6. Six, six. Um, obviously, we, we care about that for all the reasons that the organisation cares about it. Generally, not only is it the right thing to do, um, but we get ideas uh, that we otherwise wouldn't have got, particularly with people who are um, more digitally savvy, more you know, um, connected to social media, to communications, all those sort of things. And so a few of the people who have recruited recently are very strong in that area. The one area that we are still uh, underrepresented um, is in our in um, Indigenous Australians. So we do a lot of work with Indigenous Australians and even where we're not working directly with an Indigenous community on the ground, say for example our Oyster Reef project or our Cities project, we're thinking about and engaging Aboriginal communities um, in the work. And we don't have any Indigenous staff or board members. Um, and I think that is to our detriment and uh, one thing that we will and are seeking to address. 
the feedback that we get from Indigenous people, Indigenous leaders on that is that it can be very difficult for um, you know, qualified people to make time for these boards because it's often a small group of people who are being asked to, to do a lot. Um, and so we are actively working on that um, and it is an area that we still have to address. Gotcha. Oh, that's, that's helpful. That's good to know. Uh, and great progress. The, the, I think the difference between um, you know, a board with you know, one woman on it versus a board that's pretty even split, 7-5 or 6-6 six, six or 5-7, uh, is, is pretty apparent. And, and the, um, the, sort of the strength you get from that is, is an obvious one. But um, great, great to have that kind of indicator of, of progress. It's not that easy. And it's um, to make that shift because board members tend to look to recruit people who look more like themselves. And uh, so you must have had some good support from your board members to, to, to take those steps. Yeah, particularly the, particularly the board chair, Rob McLean, uh, who you know, leveraged the connection at Egon Zender um, to do the recruitment process. And Egon Zender very, rare, very rarely to never does pro bono work. Um, and you know they were brilliant at, at um, helping us solve that problem. Right, right. Um, I want to sort of move to the your engagement with the Australian government. Uh, over the years, we've had a lot of different, really interesting engagements. From I think uh, the program in, in the first ten years of its life, really working a lot with the government on land acquisitions uh, for. Um, you know, rest, for restoration to uh, indigenous management, uh, to to science and research, um, and now you're looking, I think, towards um, engagement with the government on a couple of new fronts. And I, I wonder if you'd talk about those a little bit. The, uh, perhaps maybe the oyster program is the most dramatic of of those, uh, and working at more of a local government or or provincial government. Uh, level. Can you tell me, tell us a little bit about the, that strategy and, and how that came about and, and how you saw those sorts of opportunities? Uh, yeah, the organization had a, for a long time, had a very deliberate strategy of not uh, seeking Commonwealth funding, government funding for its work in Australia. Uh, and that was a very wise decision because in the conservation um, sector, a lot of organizations got used to government funding. And when that government funding no longer existed, the achievement of their outcomes was imperiled. And we saw that sort of most dramatically when at the conclusion of what was called here the Biodiversity Fund, billion dollars over five years, a lot of organisations relying on it. And when that funding was pulled, uh, you know, a lot of organisations struggled. And I think the same thing is going to happen uh, in this year's federal budget where a lot of the organisations that rely on government funding for their operations um, are going to have a very uh, nasty uh, experience. Um, but nonetheless, we have, de we have decided that um, some government funding where it's highly targeted and strategic is in the interest of our mission. Uh, and as a result, we've got we partnered with uh, the Commonwealth government, the federal government, uh, and state governments, as you suggested, Charles, on, uh, the, on our work. So often we think about the federal government as being the primary source of, sort of conservation funding. But much of the conservation in Australia is actually the responsibility of the states. So we've recently secured a $2 million commitment from the new government of Western Australia to build oyster reefs in that state. And we've, and we've secured a $1 million from the federal government to restore oyster reefs in South Australia. Uh, and we've got a, fingers crossed, a proposal in for the Victorian state government for $4 million to build oyster reefs in Melbourne. Um, the interesting thing about those, though, is that none of that funding has come from the environment budgets. Um, the funding in uh, Western Australia came from uh, a regional development budget um, for the state, so it's about growing the economic activity in the, in the southwest of Western Australia. In South Australia, the money came from infrastructure funding. And as far as we're aware, it's the first time that uh, government infrastructure funding has been used to create a living thing. Uh, in our case, an oyster reef, uh, and in Victoria, it still remains to be seen where the gov where the funding is going to come from. That one is probably most likely to, uh, going to come from the Environment Department as part of their clean water strategy. But in the others, we're seeing whole new areas of opportunity for funding that weren't typically available to conservation organisations. 
and I'm sure it's the case in other countries that the amount of funding that's available for infrastructure and for economic development is vastly greater than the amount of money that's available for the environment. So if we can demonstrate the ability to create jobs and to uh, build infrastructure that sustains the economy, then we think there's a much bigger opportunity for us to scale up the work through those streams than just through the environment stream. All the while being super cautious that uh, we aren't building up long-term organisational resources and expense on the back of what are always short-term grants. Uh, so yeah, it's a really new it's a new way of thinking about the approach to the Commonwealth. But always being cautious that um, we were one of the few organisations who weren't badly hurt by previous cutbacks in government funding. Well, the, the characterization of oyster reefs as infrastructure is, I think, a really unique uh, and great sort of advance. Um, it'd be nice to see that happen with other si systems like the savanna burning or the, the uh, you know, mangrove systems that also provide, you know, major, um, you know, value to human communities. Uh, I've got just one or two more questions and then maybe we can move back to the, to the group on the phone. Um, the, um, you know, one of the things that uh, you all have, have started to do is to commercial, uh, com you know, bring com the commercial and business sector investment sector into the work that we do. You talked about the Murray Darling Fund, um, and you see that there are other financial models. Obviously, we, we did some work on uh, carbon farming uh, and the finance on that front. Do you see other applications uh, in uh, Australia for you know, the private sector engagement in conservation, uh, returning uh, you know, some sort of investment returns for private investors while also achieving conservation results? Yeah, there's a couple of immediate ones. Um, we always think about projects as being conservation projects first. So when we're uh, designing a project, we think about what is the massive conservation outcome that this project is trying to achieve, and can commercial adoption play a role in taking it to scale? And when we were first launching the Water Fund, or thinking about the Water Fund more than three years ago now, we weren't clear enough on that. Because when we were challenged by our Board of Advisors to say, is this a financial project or is this a conservation project? We, we were saying, oh, well, it's both. It's, ha it's having returns to investors and it's sustaining the environment. And it's true, it is, it is doing both. But what we should have said is, this is absolutely 100% a conservation first project and the investors are just what's, what we're doing to make it happen. Um, so thinking about it with much more clarity now, having the benefit of three years, yes, there are a number of areas in which um, you know, the commercial sector can take things to scale. You mentioned the carbon economy. You know, we think there's at least a tenfold increase possible uh, there if we can leverage um, private sector investment and government investment in the carbon economy. We've launched a feasibility project to look at agricultural transformation in the lands adjacent the Barrier Reef, the Great Barrier Reef, to reduce the runoff of uh, sediment, nutrient and pesticides into the Great Barrier Reef through imp improved uh, farming practice. There's certainly an opportunity for the oyster reef to, to uh, get to scale commercially. We just don't know what it is. Uh, and so we've got um, some work happening through the Mapping Ocean Wealth Program and, other, and another um, project that we're working on to work out what is the commercial value uh, of the oyster reef um, scale. Um, in the arid lands, uh, the big desert project, it's probably not going to be a commercial project. There just aren't the commercial opportunities at scale in the remote arid lands um, to have commercial adoption. There could be small scale things like sustainable tourism and renewable energy projects, those sort of things, but nothing at the scale that is going to sustain an area the size of India. So we really do need government investment and private sector philanthropic corporate uh, investment. But yes, increasingly the um, you know, uh, commercial adoption is one of the key levers that we pull, but it's not always the answer. Gotcha. Um, Imran uh, Amin has raised a point on, on the chat, sort of talking a little bit about the, the work across the region and across the conservancy and, and the way that you think about the, the collaboration with other business units. Can you talk a little bit about some of the ways you're thinking about that? Maybe I think Fish Face is one, uh, some of the, um, the work on, on the Savannah piece and, and leveraging <coughs> 
network. Um, how do you view the Australia's role in the region as well as the larger conservancy? And the other um, area, Charles, is is um, not just uh, on the uh, programmatic collaboration, uh, but in collaboration on with the development team. Uh, so in this financial year, the Australia program has raised around a million dollars uh, for projects that are largely delivered or wholly delivered in the region. Fish Base obviously was one of those, and uh, some Indonesian forest work was another. Um, I think the, I think it's a good question. We probably um, have been a little bit too uh, focused inwardly on the just the big priorities that we have to deliver um, here. But things like Fish Face, the Indonesian Forest Program, and we've got a few other opportunities that Rizal has sent through to say, you know, we could really use Australia's leadership in the region on this area, both uh, through funding and through technical um, capability, and the same is true in the Pacific. Um, so, yeah, I, I would agree with Imran that there certainly is the opportunity for us to collaborate more particularly where Australia has a leadership interest um, in that topic in the region uh, and, in, and including uh, in the philanthropy program. So, uh, for example, Marla, who is our Director of Development, has in her goals for the next financial year to raise another million dollars for the region. Um, and so there may be a perception that the organisation Australia program is funded from externally. It's actually not the case. We, you know, like many programs, we have a couple of grants out of the US, but we're largely uh, self-funded and doing our best to export philanthropy into the region. Uh, and so our development team has an explicit goal to do that for next year. But yes, agree, there's more work to be done. Charles, I have a question. Rich, uh, oh, please, yeah. Hi, Rich, this is Asmar. Um, Australia has also been really creative with some of the marketing and branding outreach that you guys have done. Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about uh, the work with nature and green dusting, uh, and how how that was started, because I think that's a good sort of story to share with them, um, with the region. Yeah, thanks, Asma. Um, the work with nature campaign, or as it was called, and I'm just looking at Amy across the desk now. I think we're going to officially rebrand or focus the brand around green dusting. We set out uh, last year to think of a really positive, fun way for people to engage with nature. And one area where we thought that had been overlooked was people getting involved with nature when they're at work. I mean, people typically spend a third of their time at work, if they work an eight-hour eight hour day, say, um, and usually it's at the desk. But every major city in Australia has, has green space. So in the office here, there's probably five parks within a five-minute walk. And I don't think we're alone in, that, alone in that. So we set out to create a movement around what's called green desking. And that's really just... You know, during your day, spend an hour outside. Go for a walking meeting, uh, have a meeting in the park, whatever it is. You know, work from your work from your local green space, uh, and then share it. You know, share it on social media. Use the hashtag um, hashtag Green Desk, and see if we can get a movement going around uh, working with nature and green desking. Uh, we just wrapped up the sort of intensive campaign for 2017. We're planning on it being a sort of an all year campaign, but with a focus in March and April. And the results this year, like last year, have been, I think, nothing less than um, extraordinary. Um, it's the first time, really, that we've seen them captured, seen the media's and public's attention captured in this way. So we had TV stations, radio stations, newspapers proactively calling us to learn about uh, what green desking is all about and the benefits to people. So we know that being in nature reduces. Uh, stress and can you know reduce the instances of something like 15 diseases, including some of the biggest killers like uh, diabetes. Um, but you don't have to go to you know remote Australia or to a national park or wherever to enjoy the benefits. Any time spent outside in nature is good for you. Uh, and the fact that it's so easy to do and it's just you know 20 minutes a day, an hour a day. Um, can really have those strong health benefits as well as making you care more about nature has really captured the public's imagination. So we've, we've got a, um, a summary report for this year's campaign that we can share, uh, but it really has been probably the best, uh, not probably, it has been the best awareness campaign we've ever done um, alongside the photo competition um, to raise the, the profile of the organisation in Australia in a way that is very core to our mission. 
And that's been really important. It hasn't, it hasn't been a marketing campaign for marketing campaign's sake. It's been a campaign that is closely aligned to the mission. Uh, and, you know, I think it's one that the region and the global organisation should think about replicating uh, just because it has, there's been something about it that has just, you know, captured people's imaginations. Uh, that's a... Uh that is fun, and, and there's the science on uh, the benefit of even a short amount of time in nature, even if it's in a even relatively urban setting, is is pretty dramatic uh, you know, in terms of blood pressure, mental health, uh, you know, the whole sort of host of indicators. Uh, there's a lot of great science out there on this on this point. Other questions from the from the group on the phone. Well, all right. Um, if there's nothing else, we'll uh, we'll let Rich go and the Australia program go. Any any last call for questions? Well, thanks, Rich. Uh, great to hear about the program. Uh, super interesting presentation, and, and uh, I think a, a number of takeaways that can be uh, uh, replicated in the region. So, uh, appreciate your time this morning, and and thanks for uh, thanks for the uh, talk. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, everybody.